Our next presenter is Professor Stephen MacDonald, uh, who will be talking about um, uh, dialysis and transplantation. Thank you very much, uh, Dorota. And like Chris, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the, the lands we meet on today. In, in my case, that's the Ghana people and pay my respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, and their elders um, past, present and emerging. The um, background Chris gave you uh, is it was a great introduction and what I was going to do today is I guess reflect on how we've picked up some of those challenges and applied them in the space of uh, end-stage kidney disease, uh, which is uh, that of long-term dialysis, both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis and kidney transplantation. One of the um, other perspectives I did want to emphasise is, and I apologise for the formatting of this, Hi, Stephen. Sorry, we have lost the audio. Sorry, Stephen. Um, we have lost audio. Hi, Stephen. We just lost the audio, Stephen.
Okay, my apologies. Is that better for the sound? Yes, yes thank you very much. Okay, my apologies. All right, <clears throat> just need to speak up. Um, was that audible at all or do you want me to? All right, so, so one of the um, things I did want to emphasise is that as well as conducting a trial within a registry-based structure from the get-go, there are other links between registries and trials. And one of the um, ones that we've exploited over the years is using a registry to perform long-term follow-up of, of trials. And there are some good examples of that, that uh, this particular area that we're in lends itself to uh, is classically a randomised, you can see he randomised controlled trial of cyclosporin withdrawal in kidney transplant recipients. And in this sort of context where the, the registry does collect data in an ongoing fashion on use of immunosuppressants, you can actually perform analyses on whether people uh, were um, remained on treatment. So you can then um, open the door to uh, per protocol um, analyses as opposed to as treated protocol. And you can also um, use registry to, to uh, track other uh, outcomes that weren't conceived in the original um, trial. Uh, and the, the critical issue here though is utilising what registries have to offer, which is an ability to uh, provide um, uh, long-term follow-up at minimal cost. Um, you can't really um, uh, adequately finance or propose at least to get funded a, a, an RCT with 10 or 15 or 20 year uh, follow-up. But that does become important in a number of these areas and I've just shown some, some brief examples here. Um, so classically, there is a, um, a link there between um, uh, trials and uh, registries and uh, the basic rationale, of course, as you've heard from registry randomised control trials is to try and combine the strengths of, of both observational registries and randomised controlled trials. Those, um, benef that, that those benefits accrue, if you like, to both sides of the parties. There's a, a large number of benefits to conducting a trial within a registry framework, and a number of those have already been um, covered. But there are um, there are others, and in particular for um, users, for people who are, if you like, in a busy clinical unit, uh, who are already faced with the challenges of data collection for their administrative data sets and for registries, the, um, the use of uh, registries to provide uh, uh, either um, enrolment or outcome assessment uh, for trials uh, avoids the uh, duplicate data collection. Uh, Chris highlighted some of the cost issues, but uh, there's a very um, very direct feasibility issue in terms of, of uh, whether you can conduct trials in the uh, in a busy clinical environment uh, at times. And of course, there are benefits to registries uh, in terms of engagement of the registry and embedding um, that uh, uh, learning healthcare system that we uh, described earlier on. So with that as background, um, within the ANSTATA registry, we've currently got four active um, registry-based uh, trials on the go. Uh, and I'm just going to talk about some of these to illustrate some of the issues around uh, outcomes and so on. We've got RESOLVE, which is a cluster randomized trial of high versus low sodium content in dialysis fluids. Um, that's, we are running the Australia and New Zealand arm with the Kidney Trials Network and the George Institute of a multinational trial. Best Fluids is a, a, a classic, if you like, registry-based trial of it's an individual, it's a blinded individual uh, randomization um, trial. Uh, the Teach PD and SWIFT trials are, I think, examples of where registry-based trials can uh, allow investigation of, of the types of interventions that are very difficult to implement in other areas. Teach PD essentially is a behavioural intervention and it's around how you train people to do peritoneal dialysis. The critical limitation or the, or the critical uh, uh, problem in peritoneal dialysis for many years has been infection and the median survival of people, not, not mortality survival, but the median technique survival on peritoneal dialysis has typically been around two years and that's limited by infection uh, in the peritoneum. And uh, so Teach PD is a, a cluster a randomised trial of a standardised curriculum, which surprisingly enough for an, a technique that's been around for 30 years has never been evaluated. 
and SWIFT is a trial that's just coming out of pilot stage of um, looking at the effect of measurement of patient reported symptom burden on, on quality of life. So there are some, uh, some a number of outcome issues that arise uh, out of that. Resolve and best fluid, resolve uh, and best fluids, if you like, are the sort of what I had uh, in my um, framework as the classic sort of easily identifiable um, endpoints that are pretty well um, validated uh, elsewhere. Uh, and um, in particular, Resolve uh, is a classic MACE hospitalised acute infarct stroke or cause mortality. For that, we didn't collect that as an endpoint within um, ANS data, so we've had to go and set that up as a new uh, endpoint to be collected for the trial, and that's and um, that's uh, comes with a whole bunch of issues, in particular around the data collection burden. Best fluids, uh, in contrast, uh, had a much lower extra data burden for collection of that endpoint, which is delayed graph function. Uh, the um, uh, Anzata Registry traditionally had collected some information about delayed um, graft function, which is defined as, as kidney transplants that don't start straight away. So typically 30 to 40% of kidney transplants have a delayed uh, onset of function and people require dialysis uh, after um, transplantation. And uh, we're collecting a greater uh, granularity of information around that. And similarly, uh, Teach PD, uh, we've, uh, historically always collected quite a lot of information around peritonitis, infective peritonitis uh, and organisms and we've needed to increase the level of granularity. The SWIFT trial, which I'll come back to later on, is uh, an example of, of the opportunities offered by randomised controlled trials embedded in registry, in registry to actually pilot and develop new outcomes which are relevant to trials uh, and to uh, registries. The um, okay, so um, best fluids. I uh, always love showing this graph because it's a it's an example of a of a trial that is over recruited, uh, and uh, this is a, a classic registry based trial. Uh, people have always entered the uh, fact of transplantation uh, into the. Um, registry uh, the trial um, when people come in and enter the uh, transplant the fact of kidney transplantation they're taken out uh, to a uh, randomization portal and then um, the outcome measurement flows uh, from that all through a registry portal and uh, for us what it does is it provides a way of embedding um, clinical units in that process very early on um, the data collection uh, and the uh, both of the short-term trial-specific data and the long-term follow-up data uh, is embedded in the ANS data database, so there's clearly no need for probabilistic data linkage. This particular endpoint, however, is not one that has uh, that is all that um, convenient to externally um, validate, as opposed to uh, some other endpoints, in particular mortality and uh, so on, that you heard um, earlier on. Very similar um, considerations really around the uh, Teach PD, although the trial as a, as a um, uh, design and as a framework is quite different. It's in a different um, group of people. It's a cluster randomized trial, but again, the, uh, the re recording of uh, outcomes is embedded in the standard ANS data data collection. And this is just a section of the, the um, uh, our, um, website where people add the um, uh, relevant uh, information uh, in and uh, that's embedded in follow-up. There is um, a series of options that people um, go through and a series of uh, outputs of, of outcomes for um, each of these trials uh, which we as a registry provide uh, to the uh, Kidney Trials Network or the George Institute, if you, like the, if you like the involved sponsoring body, because one of the things that we've developed as part of this process is uh, protocols around who follows up what, uh, who follows up missing data, who follows up um, adverse events. The um, 
critical issue around that is understanding the strengths and weaknesses of registry-based data collections. Um, as you've heard, um, there are differences in data standards. One of the other things though about registry data collections they are, is that they are typically less flexible. If you are coming to a registry, uh, particularly a large and well-established registry with a, um, a particular idea uh, and you want uh, substantial changes or changes to a substantial number of data items, that's going to be a difficult conversation, partly because uh, the data collections are very extensive in changing long-standing data collection items, be they outcomes or um, process measures. Changing those items is very um, uh, difficult. Uh, it's also difficult and it's also expensive because um, uh, typically most registries we have a, a web-based interface, we have a large and established um, database, uh, there is substantial amounts of um, uh, security uh, built in around that and uh, changing for example the uh, specifications of a single um, item uh, is uh, time consuming in terms of uh, IT technician time and also has a number of knock-on effects. And perhaps just to give you a little um, uh, example of that, when we uh, uh, kicked off with the Best Fluids trial, we encountered a slightly unexpected problem, which is that we had constructed the registry, uh, which links through to waiting list data and tissue typing data around the fact that you know, a transplant occurs and we then follow up the transplant. We didn't, uh, we didn't have the ability to uh, give somebody a transplant before we had, if you like, the appropriate data coming in from from the uh, tissue from the tissue typing and the allocation sources. But of course, what we ended up with was a clinical need to be able to randomise somebody who was uh, going to uh, receive a, um, a transplant in a number of hours' time. So there's a number of complexities like that that arise when you embed a, a trial structure in a um, reg, in a large and uh, established registry that don't arise uh, if you are constructing a de novo uh, database. The other um, thing that I um, commented on was uh, limitations around uh, SAE collection. Most of the trials we've been, in fact, all of the ones we've been involved with haven't uh, involved novel or investigational agents. And so this has not been a, a big issue, but one of the uh, consequences of the difficulties and the limitations in, in um, making uh, large changes to data sets is that collection of SAEs, which tends to be pretty bespoke for each individual trial, is something that we've typically spun off as a separate uh, data set. Uh, and so um, the, uh, the um, data sets for each of the um, uh, intervention trials that uh, I've mentioned, the, um, while the main data is held in the ANS data um, uh, registry, the SAEs are held typically in a red cap uh, data a collection that's separate, uh, linked of course by the ID number, but not actually in the same core data set. So outcomes is the topic today. And uh, as Chris has, has highlighted, one of the um, things about registry data is they're generally collected, if you like, to clinical, not research standards, and that validation studies are typically conducted in an ad hoc fashion. The ANS data registry, as a registry, hasn't had a regular uh, program of audit to check the veracity of our data. We have had a, a, an approach of doing ad hoc studies where the opportunity presents itself to validate our um, data collections against either the gold standard or other similar um, data selections with reassuring results, as you would hope. Um, but there are some really important caveats. So, um, for example, um, the cause of death, like um, Chris uh, outlined for the cardiac registry, there's really, really good agreement. We had a 96.5% uh, agreement between the cause, the fact of death notified to the ANS data registry and the National Death Index. And, and given the um, limitations of linkage, that, that's nigh on perfect. Where there was much poorer agreement, it was in the categorization of cause of death. And this is where it's critical to understand the background for the categorization. Um, and uh, the dialysis and transplant registry has a different categorization of cause of death, and in particular includes, uh, and of great relevance to the dialysis group, the ability to have as a cause of death a withdrawal from, from active treatment or a withdrawal from dialysis, which is not something that's um, there in the National Death Index. So if you're using cause-specific um, uh, 
death uh, data, then the agreement uh, is much less between uh, certainly our registry and the National Death Index. Similar considerations apply to cancer as an outcome, so that there is much, um, uh, there, there, while there's good agreement about the fact of a cancer, there's much less agreement between the way we code cancer and the ICD-10 or 9, depending on the data um, you're using, uh, from the National Cancer uh, Clearinghouse. Comorbidities, similarly, for example, we have very good agreement about diabetes and um, uh, coronary artery disease between the ANSATA registry and the comorbidities coded in hospital administration data sets, recognising that there's no sort of gold standard you could like with this. But for other um, comorbidities, for example, chronic lung disease, which is a, a less clearly defined entity, um, there's much poorer agreement. And, and so if you're using those uh, variables from registries, either as as um, comorbidities, uh, factors to adjust for, or for outcomes, there's going to be uh, some, some um, considerations that you'll need to take from there. I did want to spend a few minutes talking about the role of, of registry-based trials and actually developing outcomes within registries. And the example that I'm going to use is, is the SWIFT study, which is a, a trial being led by, by Rachel Morton in Sydney. Uh, she leads our uh, PROMS patient reported outcomes working group. One of the critical challenges uh, in many areas of medicine and certainly in kidney diseases that we have focused very much on collecting mortality and some biochemical data as an outcome and haven't um, had a great emphasis on, um, on symptoms and, and patient reported outcomes, which is of course a, a critical limitation. The um, challenge of collecting though regular patient reported outcomes, let alone patient reported experience that was, is an enormous one for registries and for health systems generally and the potential to spend a lot of time and effort and resources collecting data which is not, use, not used or not useful uh, is great. And so one of the um, things that, will, uh, that the SWIFT uh, study will allow regardless of whether the primary hypothesis is, is uh, um, uh, supported or not, is it does allow the development of uh, tools to collect uh, patient reported outcomes in the uh, dialysis setting. And in this um, study, which is just coming out of pilot stage, uh, we are um, uh, using tablets uh, to uh, get patients to uh, report both uh, quality of life using an EQ5D, which is uh, the outcome and the uh, and the symptom score using something called the IPOS renal, which is a a, a score of, of five uh, principal um, symptoms. The null hypothesis, or the hypothesis, if you like, here is that reporting of symptoms leads to um, a greater action of those on those. But as I said, the the um, in terms of an outcome, what this offers is an opportunity using a trial to actually um, uh, test, pilot, and evaluate the um, uh, use of, of a novel outcome um, and so uh, as well as the, um, the classic um, trial methodology included in this um, uh, uh, trial protocol is a bunch of other stuff around feasibility of, of um, trial collection, qualitative studies and experience of patients and nurses and doctors in the use of um, this as a way of collecting uh, these type of outcomes. Happily or unhappily, um, this is a study that, that we are doing in collaboration uh, with uh, some groups in the French registry and the UK registry. And in, in happier times when one can travel, we've uh, had uh, exciting meetings. It's always good to set up collaborators with uh, uh, collaboration with people in interesting parts of the world. But sadly, uh, I think uh, both the UK and uh, France are, are highly distracted, of course, by COVID uh, type events at the moment and will be leading the um, charge for this study. So just to, then to, to take a step back and reflect on, on some of the issues around outcomes in registry-based trials and the differences in approach to um, measurement of registries uh, between um, different areas. The um, uh, uh, registry outcomes tend to be um, uh, very pragmatic. Um, they are really or never used as, as surrogate outcomes. Um, the um, uh, registry outcomes generally are not audited or validated. And one of the things for me as a registry person that registry-based trials offer is the ability and in fact the resources to perform validation of study endpoints as is needed. 
registry outcomes are not chosen um, with specific um, interventions usually in mind and certainly not chosen with potential trial uh, trials that might come a number of years down the track. So you can see that there's a bunch of contrast then between those sort of issues and how you choose outcomes for a registry for a randomized controlled trial where you typically would choose an outcome that's carefully defined to fit the intervention and whether the, whether that be a, a drug or a device often surrogate in, outcomes used audits absolutely routine and the and the outcomes are defined really to fit something that you can be demonstrated within the time frame of the trial as opposed to registries which typically are very long term uh, outcomes. There are other considerations and Chris touched on some of these. Registries are generally not well funded um, and so that the outcome measures that are chosen are quick, easy. They can be measured in our case by, by um, satellite dialysis nurses um, and that means that um, they generally are not um, highly um, specified. They're not uh, based on, on the typical validated endpoints. Uh, that you might see in uh, trials. So um, I just want to bring you back, however, to one of the great um, attractions of, of registry-based trials, which is really a, a, the embedding with, of trials, the conduct of trials within routine um, health systems. And one of the advantages of the clinical quality registries offer is that they are already uh, embedded uh, typically in the day-to-day -day business of, of hospitals or health services, both in terms of the data collection and the feedback of the outcomes of that data into healthcare practice, healthcare policy. And uh, so insertion of trials into that framework gives you, I think, a much um, uh, greater access to uh, the places where you actually need to, to implement change or implement the results of the outcomes of trials to actually drive um, the downstream effects of, of trials. So to me, that's one of the, the critical issues uh, that uh, uh, is of benefit in the registry-based trials. Within the renal world, we've tried to set up under the rubric of Beat CKD um, a close collaboration across the, the registry and start of the uh, kidney trials network and the uh, CARI, which are the Australian Clinical Renal Guidelines Network, and the uh, International uh, Kidney Cochrane Centre is also based in Australia. So we've, if, if you like, got the infrastructure or at least the, the geographical ability and, and, to, and the um, uh, relationships to, to uh, link those uh, groups together uh, fairly um, closely. Uh, and that's um, uh, been one of the enabling things for us to, to do what we've done. And you will have seen that really the trials to date have involved uh, most of those, well, certainly the AKT and ANS data, and uh, the issues that underlie most of those trials are actually have come out of previous work driven by CARI and, um, and Cochrane. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging the funders of ANS data uh, and the, uh, the crew in ANS data, both the, if you like, the research component who are in the, the, top of the upper panel and the core data collection group who are in the lower panel. Of course, these, this again refers to times past and most of the meetings now uh, occur like that. So thank you very much. My apologies for the audio problems at the beginning and, and I'm happy to uh, and interested in the discussion and questions that might come. Thank you.